All right, B-listers, you know the drill. This is your official spoiler alert for the episode. If you don't want any spoilers, stop the episode now. And if you don't care about spoilers, hold on to your seats because this episode starts now. Hi, Court. And hello, fellow B Critics. Welcome to another episode of the B Critics podcast. This movie is the feel good, heartwarming, all around amazing drama we all need in our lives. It'll have you contemplating how you live your own life and wondering if maybe you should move to Massachusetts and live out an 1860s dream. <laughs> I've had so many 1860s dreams. <laughs> um, but before we really get into it, let's tell the people where to find us. So you can, fo- you can follow the podcast on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Be Critics Podcast. Hit that subscribe button and follow our Instagram for all the best movie content. Yeah, follow, subscribe. I think it's time to get into the episode. Woo-hoo. And this episode, we're doing just Liz and I. We don't have a guest. Mm-hmm. I think this is the first time we've done this in a proper season, so it should yep. be very fun. Woohoo! And this week we're talking about Little Women, Yay. the 2019 version of Little Women. Um, and this was my first time watching it, so yeah, first definitely reaction. not mine. I've seen this many a time. <laughs> um, and I'll give a quick just synopsis of the movie. So, mm-hmm. Little Women tells the story of the March sisters, Meg, Joe, Beth, and Amy, who are desperately trying to find their places in the world and in society in which they live. Their lives become further enriched when they meet and befriend their neighbor boy, Lori, his grandfather, Sir Lawrence, and Lori's tutor, John. Aside from their lack of wealth, the March sisters have the happiest life you can imagine. Even in the midst of loss, heartbreak, and money troubles, the family manages to keep high spirits and continue supporting and encouraging each other. In a fun little end-of-story twist, you find out that the not so exciting mundane story of a family from Massachusetts might actually be the story that the world was needing, and Joe March might just be the author to tell it. So sweet. sweet. <laughs> Have you ever um, read Little Women? No, I was supposed to read it in school, and I one hundred percent didn't, and Spark notes it. Oh, really? Yes. I was never supposed to read it ever in school, um, but. I do remember like having a copy of this book that I like as like a child, like probably like under 10, tried to read and didn't like it. Um, And probably because it's like written like 1860s English. Um, Mm -hmm. But so this movie is not the first adaptation of this movie, but it's the most modern one. Um, And it's by our girl Greta Gerwig. So, yeah, um, it's a two hour and 15 minute movie. It's rated PG um, and it was made in 2019. Yep. And it was produced by Sony and Columbia. And it has like a fabulous cast. um, Yes. Big cast. (laughs) So obviously we've got our main girl, Florence Pugh, Mm -hmm. but she's actually not the main character in the movie. So Saoirse Ronan is the main girl joe and then we have does have like a huge part though yeah florence very big part part. um and then emma watson timothy chalamet laura dern meryl streep like we'll get into all of them a lot more later but just that alone um huge cast Mm -hmm. very exciting cast like it just makes you interested in the film so yeah and they work so well together it's Mm -hmm. really great um And then obviously the movie is known for being an adaptation of the Louisa May Alcott novel from 1868, also titled Little Women. Um, It's been remade like a bunch of times, like five Mm -hmm. times. Um, And so this one's a little bit different, but yeah, probably. I think this is the only version that I've ever seen. I don't think I've seen the, the version from like 30 years ago. No, I haven't. Okay. Ready to get into it? Yeah, let's talk about it. 
So let's start with our incredible cast and like the acting. Um, and so we've got the main four sisters. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we already discussed that Joe is played by Sorsha Ronan. Um, I and thought then- she was fabulous. Like – just totally incredible. And something I saw online too is that um, – is it Sersha? Sersha. Sersha. Mm-hmm. Um, she – and Meryl Streep did this too. Um, they were not cast in their roles. They like reached out to Greta Gerwig and were like, I'm playing this character. Interesting. Like write me into this movie kind of thing. Well, Sersha Ronan had just come off of doing Lady Bird with mm-hmm. Greta Gerwig. So they must have had like – a pretty good working relationship because I think that movie was heavily awarded. Yeah. From what I saw online, though, it like Greta Gerwig wasn't like on board right away, but she like thought about it and she was like, you know, this is kind of what Joe would have done. She would have inserted mm-hmm. herself. So oh, that's interesting. <laughs> that's yeah. so interesting. Um, yeah, I agree. I think she was, I think Sersha Ronan is just an incredible, incredible actress. Like the scene where she's with Laura Dern in the attic and she's talking about how she's like so lonely and she gets really emotional. Like I felt her emotion in that scene. Um, She's captivating. Yeah. So so Joe is the second oldest sister. Um, The oldest main character. Yes. The oldest sister is Meg, who's played by Emma Watson. Yeah. And Emma Watson, Emma Watson can, can do no wrong. I was she's- literally about to say Emma Watson can do no wrong. <laughs> she's just yep. amazing. And I will comment and say her American accent is much better in this movie than some of her other movies where she's supposed to play an American. Like mm-hmm. she's believable as an American in this one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think it kind of helps too that like probably during that time, like American English wasn't completely like a hundred percent removed from British English so, mm-hmm. so like having like slips like because yeah. Saoirse Ronan definitely has a couple slips like where she sounds mm-hmm. a little um she's is she Irish or Scottish she's Irish she grew up in yeah. Ireland okay where she sounds a little Irish mm-hmm. um, what's interesting it's so we just brought up the accent part but I saw too that the filmmakers actually brought in like a dialogue coach for them to help Mm. them like with the way that they delivered their lines make it like true to the 1860s and along with that they also did an etiquette coach so like all the little like things that they're doing like how they sit and how they move and how they sit like straight up and everything is very like true to the time based on what we know that's so interesting Mm -hmm. I feel like that is such a Greta Gerwig thing to do. Like she's yeah. so good at making you want it to be believable. Yes, at making it believable. Mm-hmm. So next we have so we have Meg, then Joe, then we have Beth, um, who's mm-hmm. the third sister, and she's played by Eliza Scanlon. She felt to me almost like a side character. We didn't get a lot of her. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and- she definitely doesn't have as big of a role as the other sisters. Um, yeah, it doesn't help that she dies halfway through the movie. But. I was about to say I don't know if it's because they were gonna kill her off or what was going on, but like everyone else, we got to know like more about them, and she's just like the girl that plays the piano with the old man. Yeah, I mean she's shy too. Um, I think a lot of like period pieces like this, like well, it's like Pride and Prejudice is kind of similar because it's like a a family of daughters, like they all kind of have like their thing, and that must have been like a an attribute of writing at this time kind of and um I think that she was just like the quiet musical one and I I I think her character like yes was a side character um because clearly like we didn't get to see the arc of her story but I also think her character was really important and moving for a lot of other characters in the story yeah, she yeah, she helped you understand like the other characters better. Mm-hmm. And then the last sister and the youngest is Amy, played by Florence Pugh. She was and my fave. Yeah. She was my favorite of the sisters. I loved her so much. Yeah, she was so good. The amount of times <laughs> that she would just say, like, I'm Amy. 
<laughs> I was like, okay, like I believe that you are very young right now. Because yeah. so like at the beginning of the movie or like at the beginning of time, they're supposed to be between the ages of 12 and 16 and mm-hmm. then they grow up. So Florence Pugh is supposed to be like 12 years old at the beginning. Yeah, I related like really heavily with Amy. I I don't know. She she and Joe are like way more similar than Joe thinks they are, like just in different ways. It's very interesting to see it. Yeah, like, and I related a lot to their like older sister, younger sister relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they did that very, very well. And you get to see that too, like both with um, – Joe and Amy, and then also with Meg and Joe, where Meg is now the older sister with Joe. Um, so I, I that loved was- Meg too. Emma Watson just I like know. she does that character so so well. I know, crazy. Um, I think they all they all did their characters super well, mm-hmm. and they were to me they were very believable as sisters. Like all mm-hmm. the moments where they were kind of like roughhousing with each other and like acting like in their little attic playhouse like i just like felt the sisterly bond between them all but yeah. i think they each were unique and independent and could like hold their own on the screen mhm yep um so then we have Timothy Chalamet who plays Lori the boy next door yeah I really, I really enjoyed him in this role. I don't yeah. know that I've ever seen anything that Tim- Timothy Chalamet's been in. I think it's my okay. first time seeing him like act in a movie. And I've heard a lot like on the internet, people saying that he's like not a great actor or they're like not excited about him being in upcoming films. And so I had really low expectations for him, but I thought he did really, really well. Um, I think Laurie's like a really fun character probably for him to play. He's mm-hmm. kind of this like happy-go-lucky guy. I don't know. I, I really liked him. Yeah. I've seen a lot of stuff that Timothy Chalamet is in. And I, I, but I agree. I think he does a really good job in this movie. And I, <clears throat> in general, I think that he does a good job with acting. Um, I've never watched something that he's in and been like totally disappointed with him. Mm-hmm. Um. I think what's really effective about him is that he definitely is able to give off that like boyish charm that I think you really need in this role where he's like just one of the kids with them when they're younger and he's able to be like um, just a friend to Joe and like kind of grow into that love interest person because I think like certain actors you would have kind of a hard time believing them in their more like childhood role but I I think he does a good job of like transitioning from being younger to a bit older yeah um something that I thought was really interesting he's like relatively short for a male actor he's Mm -hmm. 5'10 and uh, I think Saoirse Ronan and probably Eliza Scanlon too are pretty tall actresses Mm -hmm. And so they had to do a lot of like weird shots with him so that he didn't look like really short. (laughs) Yeah, I was actually going to say that like one thing that bothered me about him is that like he is small compared to Saoirse Ronan Mm -hmm. and like even in their face. And so like I felt it was very believable that he would like um, lust after Florence Pugh. But when it came to Saoirse Ronan, like I – I didn't believe like the romantic connection that he felt to her. I felt mm-hmm. like the friendship bond like really hard. Like I think that came across as very natural. But yeah. I think like Timothy Chalamet to me just like looks like a boy. Like he looks like a kid. So yeah. I, have- I think that whole relationship with like uh, with Lori and Joe was kind of supposed to be like – almost it's like definitely friendship but like infatuation because she was so different and Mm -hmm. like not uh, not necessarily that he's like actually in love with her because you don't ever really see him act like he's in love with her he acts like a brother and like at the beginning of the film you see joe with frederick is that frederick the italian guy Mm -hmm. and he just is like 
watching her and just like happy that she's happy and yeah. like it's like a completely different thing but I think I personally think a little bit of that has to do with the fact that and you can disagree with me but <clears throat> I found Frederick to be attractive in the movie like he looked like a man to me and Timothy Chalamet I don't find particularly attractive like he to me like is like very boyish and I just don't think that like I believed the lust any lust that he had because he seemed like kind of immature to me yeah I that's what I was saying I don't think it's lust I think he was just like she was intriguing and he was like this intrigue must be love like I must be like in love with her but she realized that like that's not really what it was yeah but even like even when he was with um Florence Pugh like I believed it a little bit more there but like I have a hard time believing that he was like an adult <laughs> I don't oh, know I think he is so cute oh, I yeah see this is where the Italian like- <laughs> guy also very attractive mm-hmm. I think they're both attractive in different ways but also like my husband looks like a little bit of a combination between the two of them. So maybe that's what it is. <laughs> okay, maybe. <laughs> I think a lot of people think Timothy Chalamet is like very attractive. I think I'm like very much in the minority there. Yeah, um, he looks very European. He's got like the little nose and like all the things going on. Mm-hmm. I can see how you'd be like, oh, he looks like a child. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so then we have Laura Dern. Love her. She plays Marmy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> she was so good. Also, she and Cherse Ronan actually look like they could be mother and daughter. Yes. I was thinking that like all the shots of them next yeah. to each other, like uh-huh. there's one where like Saoirse Ronan is like hugging her from behind and their faces are right next to each other. And like, I'm like, they could literally be mother daughter. Yeah, they could. She was mm-hmm. great. She wasn't like super, super featured in the movie. Um, but the times that she had like a major part, it was like moving like everything she had to say was like I mean she's the mother figure right so Mm -hmm. she did that really well yeah I 100% agree I thought she was fabulous yeah she she very much like held her own in every scene that she was in Mm -hmm. um and then her husband Mr. March was played by Bob Odenkirk who oh he was great he's played he was um, in like two seconds of the movie (laughs) And then he had yeah, that cheesy line at the end. But he's very famous. Um, he oh, I plays, don't know who he is. Oh, my God. He plays Saul <laughs> in Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad. I haven't seen that. Well, you haven't seen Breaking Bad? No. Yeah. <laughs> okay, girl. I feel like you have some homework to do this weekend, to be perfectly honest. Um, wow. I, I think he is well-liked by many a person. So for those listening, I very much enjoy Bob Odenkirk. And I thought he was very goofy and jolly. And I enjoyed him as a character, even though he was a small character. Yeah, we didn't. Um, we just didn't see enough of him. I was just kind of mm-hmm. like, okay, there's dad. Like, And then he said like the one stupid line at the end. And I was like, okay. <laughs> um, and then Meryl Streep plays Aunt March. She was completely underutilized, in my opinion. Like, she was, like, kind of, like, a background theme, but, like, Mm -hmm. we didn't see enough of Meryl Streep. Like, you have Meryl Streep in your movie. I don't know. Well, I don't think she's, like, a, like, meant to be a particularly involved character, Mm -hmm. but if you think about it, like, she is very important in progressing, like, the decisions that the girls make because... She's kind of like the – and she isn't kind of. She's like the opposite of um, Laura Dern's character, right? And kind of gives this other perspective to the girls of like, hey, like you have like a life to live here. Like you got to be thinking about yourself and like what's going to happen to you Mm -hmm. when you turn too old to stay living under your parents' roof, you know? Like how are you going to survive? Mostly, she has a really big role in Amy and Amy's character development and pretty much giving her the okay to be who she is. Like, go after what you want because, like, that's all you have is what you want. At the end of the day, there's nothing else. Well, and I personally think, yes, I think she was very moving in Amy's, like, story, especially, like, taking her to Europe. 
Uh, but she was also extremely important for Joe's story because of her like choosing to give her the house at the end. I think to me meant that like Meryl Streep's character related the most to Joe because, you know, Aunt March was a single woman who lived in this house because she was rich. And that's all that Joe ever wanted was to like be a single woman. She didn't want a man. And so I think that was like Aunt March's way of saying, even though like every dialogue between Aunt March and Joe throughout was just like Aunt March scolding her basically for the (laughs) things that she wanted. At the end, she kind of gave her validation by saying like, okay, here's the house. Like do what you want kind of thing. Um, and so I, I think that was like pretty moving. Mm-hmm. I thought there was the one scene where you think like maybe Joe doesn't actually hate her is when Amy comes back and she's like, Aunt March is going to Europe. And Joe's like, oh my God, she's taking me to Europe. And Amy's like, no, she's taking me to Europe. Awkward. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Amy was so sweet. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about the storytelling next. Mm-hmm. And probably the most interesting thing about this movie is the non-linear way that it's told. So you get a lot of like future moments right at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Right at the beginning of the movie, you find out from Amy that Joe turns down Lori. And that's yeah, like she says it like right away. And yes. I'm not going to lie. I had no idea what was going on. I didn't yeah. know anything about this story. So I was like watching this and I was like, oh, poor guy, like some random girl turned him down. And it's then I'm like, before Wait he's like introduced in the movie at all. Yeah, you have no idea who the hell he is. I'm like, was she just running after this random guy? Is this her love interest? Is mm-hmm. like, who is this? And he's been engaged before. So like, is that allowed? And like all these things. And you're just like, oh my gosh, what's going on? And then, and then it flashes back after yeah. that. And then it starts story. So I think to the viewer, it almost makes like building those relationships more more impactful because you are watching it with the lens that like, you know, you're watching Lori and Joe become best friends and you're like, wait a second, like they're becoming best friends. They're not going to end up together. Like what? Like the whole time that you're watching it. But you all, they also, that also shows you that scene, shows you that, um, Amy and Lori like have something. Mhm. Yes. Yeah, and it's a lot of foreshadowing. Yeah, it's there's like a lot going on in that scene like after you've watched the movie that you understand. Mhm. And I also think it it like kind of builds in the viewer. Like we're going to talk a lot about this like theme of um marriage and romance and like it builds that desire for like Joe to find somebody and for the girls to like find love because you they bring it up like up front that there's like stuff going on, trouble in the waters, like down the line from the beginning, you know? Like you know it's not going to be like a glamorous road all the way. Yeah, it's um, Bridgerton. That's like kind of what I was imagining. I think Bridgerton's like a different time period, but like I was kind of getting like those vibes, except this is not people like coming out to society. This is just like normal life. Mm -hmm. Um, I love when stories are told non-linearly. It's my favorite way to tell a story. And I think it's so effective. And I love when they like switch between different character stories and you know, how we get the girls going to different locations. Like you get parts of the story when, you know, Joe is in New York and we're flipping back. Like, you know what time period is because of the locations where they are. And so you kind of like, as a viewer, have to piece together what's happening while you're watching it. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. I don't know if you like to watch nonlinear stories, uh, but I I love it. It's a very like effective storytelling tool. Hmm. Um. I don't think it always works. I think it definitely worked here, and I liked how whenever, because usually it was like you'd get a flashback. So you'd see you were in the present, but you're getting flashbacks. 
mm-hmm. and it would always be a flashback related to what's going on at the moment. And normally I flashback from Joe's perspective. Um, so, I mean, I, I thought it worked really, really well for this movie specifically. Yeah, I agree. I think it was a really good choice by Greta Gerwig when she was writing this to do it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, so then we have two from Greta, the you know, just the way that the world looks, right? Like the costuming, the sets that they were in, Mm -hmm. um, their house. uh, Yeah. They're – so we we were just talking about like the flashbacks and the flash forwards. She did like color play. I don't know if you noticed, but Mm -hmm. in the flashbacks, they had like a warm filter Mm -hmm. and the flash forwards had like a cool filter and the warm filter gives you a sense of like nostalgia and -hmm. the cool filter is kind of like it ages them a little bit. Yeah, Which I is think really that cool was <clears throat> very well done because I um and I know I've seen it before, but I didn't have trouble telling what time period it was in, and there were definitely mm-hmm. like mul- like three or four distinct time periods for Joe, like that they would flash between, mm-hmm. and so that must have worked really well because um, you definitely could tell like when they were supposed to be younger versus older. Yeah. She did a lot of color play. Um, Another thing she did was she assigned a color scheme to each of the sisters. So anytime you see them, they're dressed in their color scheme. So like Amy's was light blue. You saw her in light blue all the time. Yeah. Joe's is red. She's always wearing like a red jacket or a red petticoat or whatever. And then Meg was green and lavender. Yep. And um, Beth had colors too. I think she was like pink and brown maybe. And then – um marnie was always wearing a combination of all their colors that's why she was always like in like a rainbow almost i think it's marmy i think it's supposed to be like an early version of mommy oh okay yeah yeah um (coughs) i think i don't know that's what i envisioned it at first i was like um is this woman like are they all like orphans is she just like taking care of them but like no. It, like very quickly you <laughs> realize that's their mother but she just like introduces herself she's like you can call me marmy that's what everyone here calls me and i'm like okay <laughs> okay marmy marmy whatever um i think it's just supposed to mean mother oh i think i mean i'm sure yeah new englanders all would have pronunciation the r as ah when they refer to their mother so it's kind of like saying mommy yeah uh yeah interesting Mm -hmm. (laughs) i think i spelled it wrong here too i think it's supposed to be m m a r m e e -E. (laughs) um another like interesting way that greta gerwig chose to film the movie is she took inspiration from famous artists and art pieces so there's specific scenes like the beach scene that are specifically shot like paintings. So that one, she took inspiration from Homer and the way that he painted people to Mm. film that scene. And then she also said that she took inspiration from a woman named Julia Margaret Cameron, who was a famous photographer, and the way that she shot women back in the early 1900s. That's so... That is so interesting because I feel like Greta Gerwig did the same thing in Barbie where she would like take direct inspiration Mm -hmm. from something, like the way something looked and transform that into whatever she's working on. And in Barbie, she's really good at that. Like really, really good at that. Super good at that. Um, And like knowing what what inspiration to draw from and put into Mm -hmm. her movie. I think that is her one of her greatest skills yeah taking taking something that someone else did and making it your own but still having that like you can tell that this was inspired by the original piece is really really freaking cool yeah so cool. i feel like a lot of people will either just like take it and just like mimic it completely or they'll be like this is inspired on this and you're like i don't see it don't see it like <laughs> you're lying <laughs> well i think in the barbie movie you can it's so obvious that if you don't see it, you're dumb. But in this movie, it's definitely a little bit more subtle. I mean, maybe it's obvious to some people because mm-hmm. I'm not yeah. like as familiar with those references. But yeah, super great all around in terms of costuming too. Um, mm-hmm. Just like very believable the way that they dressed. I wish we still dressed like that. Like 
It would be practical to just like be able to wear a skirt, like a long skirt, like all the time. With like shorts under, like pants underneath it. Mm -hmm. How comfy. Mm -hmm. I, I will just put this out there. My wedding dress looked like these dresses that these girls had on. So if that's yeah. like any telling factor, I love the way that like the silhouettes with the corsets. Um, I will say too, you never once see Joe wearing a corset. She never wears a corset ever. Mm -mm. But all the other sisters do. It wouldn't have been Joe if she'd been wearing a corset. No. I so like cute. the scene too, like where um, Meg goes up to the ball in town and um, Lori like ends up there and he insults her dress. And I also hate the dress, but – like oh, the, I loved that dress. I knew you would like it. But when she's she like, like peep. Love when it. she's like sitting on the couch, she's like turned crying. Like just the way that she looks with like the big ball gown so like elegant. splayed around her and like her core set. Like so like it just makes her bodice look really like yeah. feminine. And like I was just like, wow, like why couldn't I wear something like that? Yeah. <laughs> I I was like upset with Lori when he said that because I was like how dare you like mm -hmm. that's so rude but you also have to like appreciate the message he was trying to send to her of like you don't need all this like you're beautiful and perfect without these like high society things that people say you're supposed to have and she mm -hmm. struggles with that like throughout her life she has the same struggle later in her marriage where she's like out shopping or whatever getting whatever they need for the house and someone's like oh don't you want a new gown and she's like yeah yeah maybe I do need a new gown and like she spends more money than she really should because she like forgets like that whole interaction she had where yeah like you don't need this when she's like, this so sweet you. and good natured too that she always comes around yeah yeah very lovable character very relatable. Like, that's just, like, how people are in general. She's, mm -hmm. like, a very normal person. So then we have the music by the fabulous Alexandre Desplat. Or Des I have no idea how to say his name, to be honest. And I should because he's <laughs> a very, very well-known composer. He's done a lot of works, won a lot of Oscars. Um, he did The Shape of Water, which is, like, probably one of his well-known ones. But some that are near and dear to our hearts, he did um, a song called New Moon on the New Moon soundtrack. And then he also did the scores for Deathly Hallows part one and two. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and he, he's a French composer, so he does a lot of like French films too. Um, yeah. And he does Wes Anderson movies, which is interesting. Yeah, but, I mean, I liked the music. I don't think I really like noticed any particular like, – tracks okay um, but it fit the time I am obsessed with piano music I think it's it's like some of my favorite music and I'm yeah. um, really really John, drawn to piano sounds and he weaves like a lot of um, soft piano <laughs> notes into the music throughout the movie mm -hmm. and to me like that hugged on tugged on my emotions a lot um, I cried like several times during this movie yeah. and I think the music was really effective for me and like getting me in that emotional state yeah we just talked about Beth and how she was like this side character or she felt like a side character but also you can tell that Beth is everyone's favorite person everybody loves Beth nobody has any quarrels with Beth Beth plays beautiful piano music mm -hmm. and like, it almost feels like everyone's kind of doing things, like, for Beth all the time, even before she got sick. Like, people were just wanting to do stuff for her. And, like, at the end, when Frederick comes over and asks about the piano and asks to play the piano, that's, like, you can just, like, by – they pan around the room and you can see everyone's facial expressions. You can just tell, like, how much of an impact she had on them. So I agree. The piano music was amazing. And mm -hmm. that actress was actually playing those pieces. Yeah, that's really cool. I thought that Meg playing the piano or Beth playing the piano was so, so powerful in the movie. And the scene where um, Mr. Lawrence or Sir Lawrence, did you go by Sir Lawrence? 
mm-hmm. where he um like was listening to the music from the staircase like kind of behind the wall so she couldn't see him and he was getting really yeah. emotional and i it just kind of reminded me like how powerful music is for emotions and how different it must have been in that time when like music wasn't as accessible as it is now and like you really depended on people to like literally play instruments for you in front of you to be able to like enjoy it and um how different it must have been and how like how much more powerful emotionally like music must have been back then um because you didn't hear it as often yeah probably all the arts honestly Mm -hmm. because like each of the sisters well not meg meg's the only one that doesn't really have like an artistic skill she has like acting but she never really like nothing ever materializes from it in the Mm -hmm. film um but each of them does something that moves somebody in a different way yeah and beth's was just music yeah very powerful one Mm -hmm. okay so now i want to get into like the themes of the movie which we love a theme there are a theme several (laughs) themes in this movie we have a laundry list the first one is dealing with anger, which specifically women dealing with anger. Mm-hmm. Women dealing with anger. Um, and so you see this like a lot throughout the movie, particularly between Joe and Amy. And we've already touched on some of the moments where Joe, you know, maybe had to stifle her anger with Amy, but a lot of times it definitely gets the best of her throughout the movie. Also, Amy deserves it. Yeah. Well, she's she a child. Does things. Yeah. yeah. But like, still. And well, I also think some of that anger, some of Joe's anger towards Amy was not her being like actually angry at Amy. I think it was frustration because mm-hmm. Amy kind of embodied everything that Joe thought was like going along with societal norms. Mm -hmm. Well, I think like one moment that's really powerful in the movie is when Amy gets mad at Joe for not inviting her to go out with her and Lori. And so she finds Joe's novel that she's written and hidden in um, the drawer of one, the drawer of her dresser and she burns it. And um, Joe comes home and is just like completely devastated that this novel that she's written or whatever she's written is like just gone now Mm -hmm. and um i i think it's to me that's really interesting because it's so so relatable to me as an older sister of a younger sister Mm -hmm. um and me and my sister have like a pretty similar age gap to what um joe and amy have in this movie exactly exactly the same a three-year age gap and like that's totally something that like my sister would have done and my mom would have said like just be the bigger person because in that moment I remember like when Laura Dern said to Joe like oh like accept the apology from your sister and I would have been like hell nah yeah she just don't let the sun go book. down on your whatever is what she says yeah yeah and like it's just it's just such an interesting thing that like that that um relation dealing with relationships like that hasn't changed in over 100 years 150 years like we Mm -hmm. still have those same like dealing with anger within your own family like despite you know loving this person so much because only like one scene later is the scene where amy follows joe into the um ice skating on over the pond ignores her and joe's like joe ignores her and she falls in and She has to save her. And then in that moment, she like – you see her have so much regret for this like anger that she held on against Amy. Mm -hmm. And like that is something that I can totally relate to. Like with so much, um, you know, like hindsight now that I'm like so removed from being a child with my sister, like our – it's so much more important to have that like – person in your life than it is to be angry at them for something that they did but also at the same time like the people that are your siblings (laughs) your family are the people that you get the most angry with because you're like wow like they should know that that's so important to me Mm -hmm. 
And she did know. She burned it because she was like, I wanted to hurt you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that so is what funny. a little sister would do. A little sister would be yeah. like, well, I wanted it to hurt. <laughs> yep. So that's why I ripped your shirt. That's why I got mud on your shoes. That's why I did whatever. I broke all your lipsticks. Mm-hmm. I wanted you to be upset. Um, And I also thought it was really powerful when Marmy, Laura Dern's character, had her confessions to Joe of her own anger that she feels because her character is like portrayed as so good, so giving, so loving. Like mm-hmm. she's so well tempered. And like then an when she, <laughs> yes, literally. <laughs> like honestly, when they brought their Christmas breakfast to that like family in need, I was like, oh my God, I hate this so much. No. Um, but for her to admit that like she feels angry so much and then, um, she just like is really good at like handling it day to day. And she even makes mention of it later when she like kind of has a joke about like being angry with her husband. She's like, now I can be angry at you in person. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's it's just interesting to me because like she's somebody who would be like, oh, she's not angry at all. But then she admits that like, no, like I really am. Like I deal with these emotions just like anybody else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you – get to watch her explain that to Joe, who's just a teenager and kind of like deciding like if she believes it or if like those are things that she can um, implement into her own life to deal with her own anger. Yeah. So So, really makes it like a coming of age story in that way too. Yeah. So we, we've been talking about the whole anger thing and mostly between the sisters and um, there's a quote that Joe says towards the end of the film that's really heartbreaking. Um, And it's after Amy and Lori have gotten married. And Joe says to Amy, like Amy says, oh my gosh, she's told you like, you're not like, I hope you're not mad because she knew the relationship that Lori and Joe had. And Joe, who is completely distraught and trying not to show it, she says, like, life's too short to be angry at one's sister. And it shows, yeah. like, a lot of her growth that she's had. Um, But that also – that's, like, the embodiment of this whole theme of, like, you can choose to be angry or you can choose – like, it's completely up to you what you choose to, like, how you choose to act and react and all that stuff. Um, But – And also Beth's death is like kind of like full circle here because it shows like all the sisters, really the whole family, just like their humanity and Mm -hmm. like how you should never take like any second for granted because that person could just be gone. Yeah, I a hundred percent. I think when that quote is said, by Saoirse Ronan, life is too short to be angry at one's sisters. Mm -hmm. I think Beth is mentioned like right after that quote. And I I think it ties it all together of that like literally life is too short to be angry at one's sisters. Like, Mm -hmm. and you're exactly right. Like you have to make this decision. Like what's more important in this moment for me to like hold on to this anger, but like also what good does that do me? Like in this moment, will that serve me and the people that I care about most in any way? Mm Mm-hmm. So yep. definitely a sign of growth. One Jeff. little fact be- about that has to do with Beth's death. So we haven't mm-hmm. really talked about it. She dies of scarlet fever. She has okay. scarlet fever and she dies of complications from it. And <clears throat> for you, for those of you that don't know, um, scarlet fever develops after you've had untreated strep, th- strep throat. So – that's like how people got scarlet fever back then. They would get strep throat. They didn't know that they needed to get it treated. It would turn into scarlet fever. Well, the entire cast at one point during filming mm. came down with strep throat. What? Which is very poetic <laughs> because that's how one of the most beloved characters dies. <laughs> I love that as you were executing the line about – or your whatever you were saying about strep throat, your voice cracked because <laughs> you're clearly yeah, dealing with I am, the cold I am of ill own. at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I think our regular so. listeners know <laughs> know your voice pretty well. Mm-hmm. Um, so the next, do you have anything else to say about dealing with anger? 
No, that's enough about angry people. Let's move yeah. on from that. <laughs> I think we've beat that one to death. Um, <laughs> yeah. So the next theme is love. Love. Yes. Oh, happy love. Um, but also not happy. Also not. <laughs> we, yeah. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is we touched on it a little bit, but like mm-hmm. Meg marrying John despite his lack of wealth. Um, yeah. And how that's like very similar to her own mother. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought that was so sweet. Like their whole arc of like how they fell in love and you could just like see it between them so easily. And then there's them one work- moment. So we talked about how the ice skating scene, how in the book burning because uh, – Amy didn't get to go to the play or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so Meg, okay. What's the guy's name? John. Nope. Lori. Lori. Lori invited Joe to go and they, he was also taking John who invited Meg. Right. So that's like Mm -hmm. what you're meant to like understand is going on because, um, uh, Amy says like oh y'all just like drop John he's unimportant and Meg's like I find him very nice mm-hmm. <laughs> and you're that's like when they go to the I theater see. together yeah yeah it's very cute yeah yeah their whole like love story in the movie is adorable <laughs> I was very drawn to it and I thought it was very believable um and I think it shows like the classic love that's portrayed is that like you love somebody despite everything and you can work through your issues and and that's what they mm-hmm. exemplify I think in the movie um and they start a family and I um, loved their love the story things. like mm-hmm. so relatable just like normal people struggles that they were having mhm so on the other hand we've got the whole like Joe Lori Amy love triangle Mm. And it comments – that whole thing comments, I think, on what it really means to love somebody romantically versus loving somebody in a different way. And yeah. you see Joe turning down Lori and him getting so upset about it. My heart was literally breaking with him. I was like, no, 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 no. Aww. Like, like – Just say yes. Run away with him. Just say yes. I know. And it's tough because like when you're watching it, you can tell that they love each other. Like very evidently, they are so important to each other. Um, But, you know, we talked about it before. Like you can also tell that they don't really like lust for each other. Like they don't have that like, especially from Joe, like she does not romantically love Lori. Yeah. Um, For everyone listening who is not yet married – if your first instinct when someone says, like, I want you to marry me or gets down on one knee to propose to you, your first instinct is to comment on all of the bad things in your relationship. That's like, that's your, that's your, that's your flag to get out. Yeah. That's and your like, red flag. <laughs> like, you can be friends with someone and be really, really great friends with someone and like love someone and not want to marry them and not be suited to be their life partner and that's completely fine Mm -hmm. but if your first instinct is to say like but what about all these other things like mm, that means that's what you're thinking about and you're not thinking about all the good things yeah for sure and you know to compliment that we get you know Mm -hmm. amy loving Lori so much and you can tell that she really unconditionally loves him like all she's thinking about when she thinks about her relationship with Lori is like being with him and romantically being with him. Right. Uh, I, I thought that was the cutest freaking thing ever. I was like, Mm -hmm. this girl literally every time she sees you, like her heart lights all the way up, like Mm -hmm. the beach scene. She, he has just introduced her to this Frederick person who he is like trying to essentially trying to set her up with. Right. And what's she doing? She is making a sketch of Lori at the beach. She's Mm -hmm. like so infatuated with this guy. And like her whole shtick is like, I want to marry someone wealthy. But then when it really comes down to it, it probably wouldn't have mattered if he had money or not. Like she still would have wanted to marry him. Yeah. And And they, I mean, they kind of touch on that because her other love interest, Fred, is like more wealthy or whatever. Mm -hmm. And she turns him down 
despite, you know, not having a clear proposal from yeah. Lori. At the same time, though, so she has this like, I'm going to use the Twilight word, irrevocable love for Lori. <laughs> But mm-hmm. my favorite interaction between the two of them is actually when she's standing up for herself and she's like, you're not going to pick me second. And I yes. think she specifically says, I will not be the person you settle for just because you cannot have her. Yes. And I think that was a turning point for him too in being like, if this is like, this is really what I want, I have to make it evident to her. It can't yeah. just be like, oh, I'm going for your sister because you're not available kind of thing. I thought it was interesting that they were able to get past that, um, to be honest, because – and I think it just goes to show, like, in the end, um, Amy's motivations for just, like, life in general because, like, if she had been as strong-willed as Joe, like, she definitely wouldn't have – I mean, she, obviously, Joe didn't want to marry him, but, mm-hmm. like – Like, she did want to get married and she did love him. And so, like, she was able to kind of get past some of that stuff that she was, like, so upset about. I think, too, it has to do – some of that has to do less with it be, like, the situation at hand and more of, like, she knew what she wanted and she was going to get it Mm -hmm. kind of thing of, like, okay, there's this whole situation, but, like, let's put that away because this is what I want and like yeah. everything else like is second to that. Yeah. Yeah. So like the the differences between their relationships definitely um <clears throat> I think symbolized a lot about like what it means to love somebody. Yeah. But apart from like romantic love, <laughs> we also have familial love displayed in this movie <clears throat> um really powerfully honestly and yeah. I, I I think in like a lot of ways Laura Dern's character like um I don't know like led that like familial love like by the way she led her family the way she like taught them to love other people Mm -hmm. um and you could see it in just the way that the daughters interacted with each other like just they genuinely loved being around each other and spending time with each other and um, I think other people were so drawn to that about them yeah, I literally like wrote a note and I was like, they are like electric. Everywhere they go, people are like obsessed with them. And it's mm-hmm. partially because it's for these four like beautiful young women walking around, happy as can be, like seemingly like no worries in the world. Like that's part of it, right? People are drawn mm-hmm. to people that are happy. Um, but also they're just good people. And the more that they're around people, like others, so like the Lawrence family. The more that they're around the Lawrence family, the more the Lawrence family loves them. Like when they all show up because Amy has been like hit by her teacher at school, they all show up there and you can just tell like all the men in the room are just like infatuated because they're like, who are these like amazing people that are just Mm -hmm. like existing next door who we've never interacted with? Mm -hmm. It's crazy. I also loved like every time they would get a letter from their father, how the girls would just like (laughs) all crowd around around Laura Dern and (laughs) yeah I thought those moments were so sweet because they were just like any like small words that they got from him they were just so like everybody was together yeah on it so I thought that was really really powerful as well Mm -hmm. um and then the last theme I want to talk about is this idea of like feminism versus loneliness and mm-hmm. I think this was Saoirse Ronan, um, so Joe's, like, main theme throughout the movie. It was, like, her MO. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is where we start to get, like, some parallels to um, Mary Louise Alcott's life. Mm-hmm. Um, or Louisa May Alcott, Lord. I'm speaking out of turn. Um, so you have – with Joe's character – constantly like you're going up you're talking about what it is to be a woman alone in this society um Mm -hmm. and then also this idea of like marriage as a transaction and so it starts um pretty early on in the story where joe says i can't get over my disappointment in being a girl yeah and it's because all she wants to do is um 
you know, be her own person and make it her own way. And she has so much struggles because she literally can't do that in the society that she lives in because she is a woman. Yeah. And she says that line after saying um, that her father has gone off to the war and she's like, and Mm -hmm. I shouldn't be there with him. Mm -hmm. But I can't get over this disappointment of being a girl. Like I'll never be able to do that. Yeah. So what's really interesting is that um, in real life, so Louisa May Alcott bases Joe on herself, Mm -hmm. um, but she in real life actually is a Civil War nurse. And so in the movie or in the book, she portrays her father as being the one that goes to war and Joe actually her being the one that like wanted to, right? <coughs> but in real life, like she actually did do that. That's very cool. Mm-hmm. Um, there's another quote that kind of exemplifies this whole situation. It's a little bit of a long one, so bear with me. But she says, women have minds and souls as well as just hearts, and they've got ambition and talent as well as just beauty. And I'm sick of people saying that love is all a woman is fit for. Yeah. And she's pretty much just saying like, I'm not just here to like be pretty and show someone else love. Like I'm here to do all these other things. Like I have ambition and I have dreams and like I'm ready to start living them. And yeah. she just and, couldn't. And she she does in in the movie. She turns down Lori and she goes to New York to try to like make her own dreams a reality. Yeah, but she also quits because of her yeah. own ego. <laughs> well, she quits because of her sister, so she goes home. Well, um, she really leaves because Frederick tells her that her stuff is not good and she's like, you just don't understand. And then she's like, gets upset and leaves. Well, I think she leaves because of her sister. I think those two things just like dramatically happen at the same time time. um but she you're totally right she quits she never goes back right her mother gives her the opportunity and says like you should go back to new york and she doesn't um and then she has that really really emotional moment with her mother where she explains and expresses like how lonely she is and so it's like her navigating this place where she wants so badly to like be independent and make it her own way and she has all these obstacles in front of her but, but she's she still also human. Is yeah, she's still human and she wants companionship and she wants um to be happy. Yeah. I think she was struggling more so with like what it meant to get married than like actually like getting like being with someone. She was like, I don't want to give up like everything that I am just so that I can have a life companion. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Joe's not the only person in the movie and I'm sure in the book too that like has this struggle at one point Amy has goes on this big long monologue which we can talk about that now or we can leave it but yeah talk she, about it it like basically boils down to she says like the world is hard on ambitious girls mm-hmm. and ambition is diff- is shown differently in Joe and Amy and all, honestly all in of, Meg all too them. yeah mm-hmm. Um, but like when I heard her say that I kind of thought of Taylor Swift and that's like kind of Taylor Swift's whole thing is she's like, like I'm, I'm out here and like, I'm doing this and like, it's so much harder for me as a woman, granted 1860 is very different than 2023, but Mm -hmm. that's, it's like, it's like the same thing. We're, We're still having these struggles, different scales, but still going through it. Yeah, yeah, and um, even Meg has kind of a a talk with Joe about it because she says that like I don't know the exact quote, but she says that just because her dreams are different doesn't mean they're not like important. just as important. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I I made that note too, and I said it's it's kind of the juxtaposition of Joe, right? Joe's mm-hmm. Joe's not really understanding like just because you're not this like super strong independent woman doesn't mean that you don't have value like Mm -hmm. being a mom and being a caretaker and being like a wife is like just as important as being a writer or being an artist or whatever it is you're going to do with your life as long as it's what like what you are being fulfilled by that's enough Mm -hmm. um 
And probably the like the most outright way that this is um, shown, this theme is displayed in the movie is this whole idea of like Joe getting married in real life versus in her book. And so um, you have this like cut like right at the end of the movie. So you have Frederick who comes to their house and mm-hmm. like very clearly he's into Joe. And so he leaves and all of the family says like, go after him, go after him. And so yeah. you see Frederick like leaving in the rain and right at that moment, it cuts to Joe in the publisher's office. Mm-hmm. And that was the end of her book. Yep. And so she's in. explaining that she doesn't get married at the end because it isn't the right ending. And he says, absolutely not. Like, <laughs> you got to get – You ha- she has to get married, girl. Like, she ha- like yeah. people don't want um, a, a literary spinster. Like, they don't want her to be alone because, like, that's mm-hmm. not going to sell. And – so when that happens, they have their tiff and she goes back and forth. And then um, – which I think that is just like so like so directly powerful of her, her saying like I'm literally going to like sell off my heroine to you. Like I'm going to make – I'm going to marry her off for you. Like I, I'm changing the ending of this story that I want. But that it's interesting because then it does actually cut to like – What happened in real being life. Being married and like getting with Frederick. Or at least and- kissing him. You know? Yeah, yeah. Like you get to see <laughs> that like romantic ending, and so, yeah. um, it, I think that is really, really, really well done by Greta Gerwig, mm-hmm. and that's where it ties into um, Alcott's the author's real life because um, she really wanted that ending in her, in the novel. So she wanted Joe to remain a literary spinster in the novel. So Greta Gerwig had that bit about Joe struggling about the end of her novel to be a commentary on Alcott's real life. Oh, interesting. Um, I mm-hmm. thought it was super, super fitting that the ending wasn't like her getting engaged or her getting married. It was her going after the guy she wanted. So like mm-hmm. she was she was doing what she what she was like she was living the life she was speaking about because she wasn't waiting around for somebody else. Like she was making it happen for herself. Well, and like they didn't even make a big thing about it. Like they kissed, but they never showed them get married, like nothing, right? They just showed her opening the school, Mm -hmm. which was her her real dream, right? Like she wanted that and she got her family to be around her. And so all these people, all these people, like not just Frederick, but her whole family, her whole, the people that were important to her were with her in the end of her life because all those pieces are all those love relationships that she had, whether they were romantic or familial or friendships, like those people were all with her in the end. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to say I would love to have a sequel to this movie. Love. Yeah. I would love to see like, where are they now? Or like pick up where it left off and like, what's the next novel? You know, like I, I would love that. I, this is, it's just like so good. It's so wholesome and like Mm -hmm. happy. It's just a feel good. I love that. Um, I agree. I love, I love this movie. Um, and I want to, I want to close the loop on the, um, Louisa May Alcott. Before we do that, I have one thing to say. Um, I meant to bring this up when we were talking about Amy's monologue and then I got carried away. Okay. Um, but in her monologue that she does, which I think is like a pivotal point in the movie, um, it's for her character. You see that she's not just this like gold digger. She it's like it's more than that, and it means more to her. And you kind of realize that okay, maybe she's not this like dumb silly girl. There's like more behind Amy. Mm-hmm. Um, but what's interesting about that is. That was a last minute ad. It was not originally part of the movie. And that whole interaction there, her monologue and the way that um, it's all portrayed was actually inspired by a conversation that Greta Gerwig had with Meryl Streep. And Meryl Streep was insisting that they include a dialogue as a way for modern audiences to understand the helplessness of women at the time. And to mm-hmm. kind of like show what what why Joe's character was so against getting married, what it meant 
like what she would be giving up to marry someone and is that, are you talking about her monologue like right at the end when she tells joe to go after frederick no or no the mon- when she's talking to Lori and when she's, she's telling like, him like i don't what? want to marry you because i don't want to be joe's seconds basically no 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 she's telling him about she's like painting when she's painting got it when she's painting before frederick gets there and they're talking she's saying like um he's telling her don't get married because you don't love him and she's like love is relative because like this is what i would be getting out of marriage but this is what he's getting out of a marriage kind of thing and this is what i'm giving Mm -hmm. up by marrying um that whole thing was written on a scrap piece of paper like minutes before they shot the scene oh that's wild greta gerwig and meryl streep were like having this conversation and greta was like let's go for it and just like handed it to florence pew and they did it and it's like a huge part of the movie it was one of my favorite scenes that's really telling too about like the power or florence pew's like acting ability like i think she's really able to like understand a character and like portray that character well she got an Um, oscar nomination for this for this movie she should and a lot of people think it was that scene that like pushed her over the edge to get that nomination it was a great scene she did a fabulous job i mean she had i mean i just mentioned multiple like you said you said monologue and i was like well which one one? there's (laughs) multiple in my head that like stand out as powerful moments where she says something to joe and it it really like pivots joe's way of thinking Mm mm-hmm yeah. Or, and she or also Lori. has that whole thing at the end where it's just the sisters, the three of them walking mm-hmm. and um, they're talking about her novel and Joe is saying something about like, like the importance of information is there's some, something she says. And then Amy says back to her, like, no, like it's important because you wrote it. And yeah. that was like also another pivotal point for joe because joe was like i don't have to write what people want i can write about me and it's still important or i can write about random families in massachusetts and it's still important here we are talking about it for over an hour so Mm -hmm. (laughs) must be a little important (laughs) the only thing that i wanted to say um about alcott because i think it's funny Mm -hmm. is that um so she wanted Joe to remain a literary spinster like herself, but feeling the pressure from readers and her publisher, she ultimately chose to pair her heroine off with um, Bear, who is described as a much older, not handsome man in the novel. <laughs> Why would you do that to yourself? <laughs> well, I think because like she felt like Joe, like she didn't want her hair like, let me get these readers off back. <laughs> she was like well if i'm gonna make her get married then he's gonna be ugly like i like literally i think that's how she was feeling <laughs> that's hilarious um, yeah <laughs> one last thing i wanted to touch on because i think this like theme it's not really like a, a main theme but it's like a small theme in the in the movie Mm -hmm. Um, And I want to touch on it because I think it's very pertinent to what's going on right now in the movie industry. And um, it's kind of this idea that artists – and it's shown through women in this movie, um, but it's the idea that artists are undervalued. And I have a quote from – Um, I think I found it on Screen Rant. It's from the 15 quotes from Greta Gerwig's Little Women that are surprisingly modern. Um, That's their article. But they said plenty of companies in the boom of social media still want artists and writers to work for the exposure and praise rather than a paycheck. And a lot of what happens in this film through the art of the women is that it's undervalued. It's not appreciated as much as the men or as, for whatever reason, other artists. and there's a point where Joe says, I cannot afford to starve on praise. Joe and Amy talk multiple times in the movie about how like they can't just like do what they're doing to do it. Like it's more way more meaningful to them if they're able to like make a living off of it and be compensated for what they're doing. And so yeah. Joe goes back and forth with Frederick about like her work right so she starts writing all these like 
bits that the publisher wants her to write that are so like they're like gruesome and exciting. Mm. But you know, Frederick says, well, they're not like they're they're not they're good, not you. right? They're not like what yeah. you would write. And she kind of says to him, well, like I can't, I cannot afford to starve on praise. And I think what she's trying to say is like she's forced into this corner where she has to write this way because it's what sells and it what's make makes her money. Mm-hmm. And you see that you do see it. I think personally with Amy when she's having her monologue with Lori, where she tells him like, I can only be a like I can't be a painter. And he says, why? And she says, well, I'm not the best. And he says, but like, you're so good. And, and she says, it doesn't matter because other people don't value it the same way that he does. Yeah. And she's not going to make money from it because Mm -hmm. despite it being so good, you know, like she's not going to get the, the compensation that she deserves in that moment. And so I think that definitely ties back to the quote that you have here saying, like tying it back to the strike that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just like, it's just a shame that people aren't seeing, not people, there's a select few people that aren't seeing the value that artists have right now and are not like showing them, not just through saying like, oh, good job, like pat on the back, but you should like showing people that their, that their life's work is meaningful And that like, not only is it meaningful, but you're willing to like show them monetarily how much it means what they're doing. And particularly like it's really comparable with Joe, the writer, and Mm -hmm. you know how this whole deal started with the writers and how like they're kind of like behind the art that we're all watching, but like nobody gives them the compensation that they really deserve. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So... I think that wraps up our discussion. Is there anything that we didn't mention that we should include? Girl, we talked about so much. I know. We've been recording for so long. (laughs) Could you imagine if we had a guest on this one? It would have been like a two-hour episode. Two-hour episode. But also, I'm here for it. Yeah. Love it. Um, Okay. So let's go into our ratings. And as a reminder, guests, we are viewers. We use Letterboxd um, for our rating and so it's zero to five stars with half star increments. Mm-hmm. So with that, Liz, would you like to tell us your rating? I give this five stars. Amazing. I was I I honestly contemplated putting this in my letterbox top five. I just couldn't wow. or my top four. I just couldn't like pick one to take out. So that's why it's not up there. Mm-hmm. I was amazed by how much I loved this. I can't believe I waited four years to watch this movie. Like I am like ready to watch it again. I watched it today. I'm ready to watch it again tonight. Like, I absolutely love this movie. I loved everything it stands for. I think it was a very respectful piece. I think it was, I mean, Greta Gerwig, like props to her, but also props to everyone involved in making this movie. It was just fabulous. I got so much enjoyment out of it. Totally worth the $3.99 that I paid to rent it on Amazon Prime. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I, um... 100% agree with everything you just said. I, you know, you mentioned that you want to go watch it again. Like I was thinking today, like how much, you know, I've seen this movie multiple times and how I would love to see it again um, and will, I'm sure, watch it again many times. Mm -hmm. Um, And one thing that I really liked about this movie is, you know, the modern twist on the story. Um, And I I have to put this this quote in that I forgot from Greta Gerwig Mm -hmm. um, where she says, like, I just knew I could not do the ending just as the book did, especially because Louisa didn't really want it to end that way. If we can't give her the ending that she would like 150 years later, then what have we done? We've made no progress. So I think that just speaks to like Greta Gerwig's like power as a director and as a writer to like Mm -hmm. make this story modern and entertaining for somebody in 2019 and still today. Um, she did a really good job too. I know we're like done talking about the movie, but just no, like keep as going. this, she did such a good job showing like all the facets of feminism. Feminism is not just like being strong and independent. Feminism is also like going after what you want. And feminism is like knowing your own value, even if that value is being a mother, like yep. just like being who you are and following your passions is like what feminism is. And that's just amazing for like, all women to see that just I love it 
Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I gave this movie a four and a half out of five. So Woo. very powerful rating. <laughs> yes. And then like we always do, let's talk about what everyone else is saying, even though ours are the most important. We're going to talk about them too. Um, so the letterbox average is a 4.1 out of five, which is pretty good. Honestly, very good for letterboxd. Um, the tomato, the rotten tomato people, they got this one right. Honestly, usually yeah, they're I wrong, so. but they got this one right. Um, the tomato meter is 95 and the audience scores a 92. That's like right in line with what we were giving it. Mm-hmm. Um, IMDb is a 7.8 out of 10. And then 80% of Google users liked the movie. All very strong scores. Super strong. Seems to be a very well-liked movie all around. Yeah. If you haven't watched it and you somehow made it through this entire episode without thinking you need to go and turn it on now, now's your time. Everyone else loves it. You will too. One thing that's interesting is I think I want to read the book now. Oh, no, not me. I like the movie too much. <laughs> <laughs> I would be upset. I'd be like, no, that's not, how, that's not what the movie said. <laughs> I'm doing book club tonight and it's not my night to like nominate books. And I'm so sad because I totally would have nominated this book. You just got to like write it down for the next one. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'll put it in my um, want to read list. <laughs> All right. So I think that's it. Yay. All right. Well, Goodbye, Be Critics fam. Thanks for tuning in to our Little Women episode. Leave us a rating, a review, drop us a comment on our YouTube, and leave us an answer to our poll and Q&A section on Spotify. You can find more information about the podcast and our whole podography on our website, becritics.com, or find links to all the things on our link tree in the episode show notes. And next week's episode, we're going to be discussing Fighting With My Family, which is another Florence Pugh. Um, And we'll have the movie boners on as our featured guests. Be sure to check them out. We had so much fun recording with them. These guys are a hoot and you really don't want to miss it. Yeah, totally agree. They are hilarious. It's a super good one. So be sure to check that one out next week and make sure you watch the movie before watching the episode. Mm -hmm. And be sure to subscribe and follow so you don't miss it. You can Mm -hmm. find us on YouTube. Subscribe on YouTube. Um, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. Yes. If you subscribe to us and or follow whichever one is your like main thing, you'll get like a notification when we post a new episode. It's like Christmas every Monday. Christmas every Monday. <laughs> Welcome at midnight. Yeah. All right. That is all we have for you guys. So we'll see you on the next one. Bye, guys. Bye.